talk about fear. So there's a couple of things about that. First is that this is not going to be a self-help talk. This is not going to be about overcoming your fear. And one of the reasons it's not about overcoming your fear is that as a horror screenwriter, I have a somewhat complicated relationship with fear. It's not just about overcoming it, it's about using it, perhaps. The second reason that this is not going to be any kind of self-help talk for you guys, it may be for me, but it's not for you guys, is because as a horror screenwriter, I'm not the guy you want to take advice from. <laughs> All over the world, on TED and TEDx stages, you have great thinkers, you have great scholars, you have activists, you have people who are changing the world in a positive way every day. I am the guy who wrote the original screenplay for the film Strippers vs. Werewolves. <laughs> <sighs> so if you're going to take life advice, don't make it from me. All right. Uh, everything I'm going to say is true, except I'm going to throw in one lie. So see if you can spot that as we go through. Throughout my childhood, and actually through most of my adult life, my greatest fear was needles. Now, my fear of needles got in the way of life to the degree where I might try and, you know, avoid going on a really nice holiday just because I didn't want to have the inoculation that I'd be required to have before I went. So this was an annoying fear. It was something that bugged me. And so I thought I might try and work out how it came about to see if by kind of reverse engineering it and looking at where it came from, I could maybe kind of tone it down a bit so that it didn't get under my skin so much. And I, I placed my fear of needles with two experiences that I had during my childhood. Now, the first of these was a bad reaction to an injection that I had when I was four. I have no recollection of this, but my family tell me it's true. The second of these experiences, well, I can take you back to this one. 1987, sitting in a class at school. Now, in 1987, they made all the school kids have uh, TB jabs. I don't think they do anymore. But back then, they had to do that. And before the TB jab, they would have a tester to see if anyone had an allergic reaction. So an English class, kids sitting there, and one school kid is sitting there, looking nervously at the little mark on his arm from the tester, starts to feel faint, blacks out, falls to the floor, hits the hardwood floor, wets himself in front of all of his classmates. I probably don't have to tell you who that kid was. <laughs> well, I might actually. It's a kid called Keith. He used to sit behind me. <laughs> um, and I looked at Keith. And I, <laughs> no, I didn't actually laugh because even at 13, not, not because at 13 I had any basic human empathy. I mean, you must have met 13-year-old boys before. The reason I didn't laugh at my friend lying on the floor was because I was sitting there thinking, I'm next. I'm next. I had a bad reaction to a jab when I was a kid, and I'm going to be next. So I go white as a sheet, they take me to the nurse, and they delayed my jab, which then meant that I had a whole week to psych myself up to it. All of my friends were having their injections, I didn't have mine. I had a week to think about it, a week to stew it over, built it up to something huge in my head. And by the time I actually went and had that injection, the only way I could get through it, and this is true, is by playing a mental loop of a Bruce Willis album in my head, because that was the closest thing to cool that anybody had in 1987. So that, I think, was one of the, the reasons that I developed this needle phobia. But by looking at it, taking a step back and going, okay, there's the reaction when you're a kid, and then there's the bad experience in the classroom, maybe by looking at those, I was able to, as I say, reverse engineer it and stop worrying so much. And that's true. I'm no longer as phobic as I was. Now, I need to emphasize this isn't some kind of miracle conversion. I'm never, I'm not, and I will never be at the point where I could get a tattoo or give blood. But I am at the point where I can maybe have an injection before I go away on holiday or something like that. So I figure, progress made. Fantastic. So I started to think about other things that bothered me that maybe I could kind of tweak as well. Maybe if I could place where my other fears came from. I could find something positive from that and lower the fear level of it. I've always had 
I've always had a slight uneasiness around barbers, hairdressers, um, sitting in the you know sitting in the little chair, looking at myself in the mirror. I always feel this kind of I think the closest word is dread. Um, now I think that part of this is just a natural part of growing older. That if you're forced to sit and look at your own face for half an hour, <laughs> and you sort of get this sense of dark grief for like all the hours frittered away and some horrible sense of mortality. But it's something beyond that. There was something else. There was something about hairdressers and barbers that made me very unhappy. And I traced that one back as well. And that one led to the two Ronnies. Because when I was a kid, the two Ronnies had a sketch that was a parody of the Sondheim musical of Sweeney Todd. You had Ronnie Barker in a dress, and you had Ronnie Corbett and Little Ginger Wig, and they were slitting customers' throats and turning them into meat pies, and it was a parody, it was a sketch, it was a joke. But as a child, I had no way of putting it in context, and it left all this stuff in my head. And so again, because I had some success with the needles thing, as I said, not to the degree where I could get a tattoo or give blood, but certainly some level of success. I thought, well, maybe if I can track down this two Ronnie sketch that freaked me out so much, maybe I'll be able to, you know, have a slightly more relaxed attitude towards barbers and hairdressers. And it was actually not very easy to track it down. At the point I started doing this, it hadn't been released on DVD. It has now. And I think it's kind of interesting that out of the whole nine series of the two Ronnies prior to the point this sketch aired, if you buy it on DVD, the disc with this sketch actually has a higher certificate than anything else that they did for the previous nine years. So it is an oddly dark sketch. It's kind of closer in tone to some of the gory and Monty Python stuff rather than the kind of cuddlier two Ronnies thing. But for me, just tracking it down and actually watching it, I was able to go, huh, okay. I could think back to how I was as a child and somehow take some of the sting out of the experience of uh, going to the barber. So just by revisiting it and thinking about it logically as an adult, I was able to reduce my fear of barbers and my equally inconvenient fear of Ronnie Corby. <laughs> <laughs> so this was two for two. I thought, OK, two for two. And now I've got to be honest with you, this last one was kind of a biggie because it was a bit abstract. I had an image that lurked in the back of my head for the best part of three decades, and it had an odd power over me. It was the thing that had scared me beyond anything else as a child. I'll tell you what the image was. It's an image of a stage magician. Nick. Um, an image of a stage magician stood like this, levitating a volunteer from the audience. But as the audience member levitates, their head comes off, their arms come off, their legs come off, their eyes go kind of cold and dead. All these floating limbs, this is a bloodless process, these floating limbs are kind of detached like Lego parts. And the magician's going, ta-da! And someone in the audience is standing up and saying, you've killed them! And the text over the top of this image reads, murder magic. Now this image disturbed me so much as a six-year-old. And you know where I saw it? I saw it in an issue of Spider-Man Pocketbook in 1980 that my mum had bought me because Spider-Man was my favorite superhero. And so I was sat in the car outside the news agents, my fingers sticky with whatever sweets it was I persuaded her to uh, buy me as well. And I opened this comic book and I saw this image and it absolutely scared the beans out of me. I threw away the comic, I tore the comic up, threw away the comic, I refused to buy any Spider-Man stuff for like six months. And so on this spirit of going back and looking at uh, these things that have bothered me, I thought I need to get this comic. I need to find this comic so I can, you know, look at it and maybe that will help. Problem was, Google was no help. Google, Spider-Man, murder magic, nothing. Nothing, not a trace of anything. I thought, that's weird. Surely, you know, you associate the internet with being able to bring up anything that you look for. So I ended up trawling around on eBay, and the thing was I couldn't really remember what the cover of the comic was. But I thought, if I see it, I think it will trigger something. So for weeks, maybe months, 
I sat and looked through every Spider-Man back issue that came up on eBay that was within that kind of time limit, and eventually, I, was, I saw one, I thought, I think that's it. And I was like 50-50 on it. I wasn't, you know, it wasn't 100%, but it was about 50-50 on it. I ordered it. The day the package turned up, with the perfect timing, the day the package turned up, I was in the throes of the worst fever I have ever had in my adult life. I was laid up in bed, I was incoherent, I was confused, I was sweating, and then I opened this package, and there was the picture exactly as I remembered it. Now, if you have never confronted a picture that barely scarred you, that badly scarred you as a child, if you've never confronted that 30 years later, while in the grips of a terrible fever, I actually kind of recommend it. Um, <laughs> Because what happened was that when, you, when something like that happens in that kind of situation, it, promo it promotes a really strong emotional response, and that promotes really strong memory creation. And so now, when I look at that picture, I associate it with me looking at it as a feverish adult, and not me looking at it as a terrified child, and I'm able to put it in context. And the weird thing about it was it wasn't actually a uh, panel from a 1980 Spider-Man comic, it was actually a panel from a 1951 issue of Astonishing Comic that they reprinted and that they put in it as filler. Uh, so by the time I saw it, it was nearly 30 years old. Now it's 66 years old, that image. But it was only, I was only able to like put a stake in its heart and stop it having this power over me by revisiting it as an adult. Now, this was one of the things that made me think that I can, if I can start to lower these levels of fear, I can maybe try and look at other points in my life where fear has been inconvenient, and I can uh, maybe go some way to making amends. I think fear can sometimes work like a virus, and I want to give a couple of examples of that. Now, uh, the first of these is the, uh, my first movie. The first movie I made was a thing called Trash House. It was a splatter movie. I made it in a warehouse in Shoebury, and uh, when, I, when I sold it, it was actually got really good distribution. It was in every blockbuster in the country. And I used to get emails from other filmmakers asking for advice. I got an email from a filmmaker called Mark, and he said, I'm making a movie. I want to shoot it in standard definition uh, video. I'm already making it. What do you recommend? And I said to him, no, man, don't do it. Don't shoot it standard definition. Uh, you won't be able to sell your movie. And that was my fear talking. I gave him bad advice. It was me wanting to stay one step ahead and prove how clued up I was because HD was really cutting edge at this particular point. Uh, and the thing is, Mark, Mark, I'm sorry because that was bad, bad advice. Because Mark went on to shoot his movie on standard definition video for 45 quid and he sold the cinema rights and it got a cinema release in loads of territories all over the world. So it's an amazing movie. It's called Colin. It's a really smart zombie movie. So uh, do check it out if you get the chance. So there was, there was Mark. I also had uh, a student of mine, I sometimes lecture about idea generation, uh, and a student of mine who followed my career with a great deal of interest, uh, he, he, he tweeted, rather, at a celebrity who'd just been cast in the movie of a screenplay that I'd written. And he did this with great enthusiasm, in a sort of just reaching out and saying, hey, congratulations on being in this movie that my lecture has written. And I said to him, please don't do that, it's not professional. And I kind of damped him down on it, and I was wrong, and I'm sorry, because that student is now the celebrity liaison officer for like one of the biggest production companies in the country. And that was the thing he did. It was the thing he was great at, reaching out to celebrities. And my fear of it reflecting on me meant that I damped down that enthusiasm. So, Dan, I'm sorry for that. And the last one of these, the last one of my apologies, my great apology reel, is uh, I had another friend called Mark. So if you're wondering whether the lie was that I was making up names, I'm not, because I wouldn't make up two names of Mark, because that's just mad. Uh, but I had a friend called Mark who was an amazing blagger. And one day, uh, he blagged tickets backstage to our favourite band. This was a band we loved. We'd seen them play the Pyramid Stage at Glastonbury. And he said, I'm going to go over and talk to them in a wave of beer and enthusiasm. And I said to him, no, Mark, don't. We've had an amazing day, man. And if you go and talk to them now, you know, don't meet your heroes. It could mess up all our memories. And he went and he pushed me away and he went and spoke to the men away. And I'm really glad he did because he ended up managing them. <laughs> and so in future, he was the one organising the sold out gigs and dealing with over-enthusiastic fans 
like the one that he had been. So Mark, I'm really, really sorry, man. I should never have tried to stop you meeting them, but I did. I think sometimes we're not aware of how our fears can transmit to other people, because sometimes the other people are enthusiastic and don't even really think about what's possible and what's scary. My daughter actually said to me once, Daddy, how do you split the atom? Don't worry, I'm not going to do it in the kitchen. <laughs> so, so where does this leave us, this little journey? Well, I think that my take home from it would be that uh, fear can suck, but fear can be useful. At the end of the day, I turn a lot of my fears into screenplays and then turn those screenplays into cold, hard cash. So, winner, winner, chicken dinner. But uh, fears, fears can be uh, terrible and they can be useful, but fear is nothing to be scared of. Much like ridicule, for anyone whose music references go back that far. Um, so, yeah, oh, I'm actually at the end now. Um, <laughs> surprised myself, it's flown by. But you might be asking yourself what the lie was. I promised you a lie in there somewhere. Now, the storyteller in me really wants the lie to be that you know, I said I'd never get uh, over my needle phobia enough to get a tattoo uh, or to give blood. What I'd really, really love the lie to be would be that I could lift up my T-shirt and have a huge tattoo all over my back of all the things that I've spoken about, like the needles and the stage magician and all that sort of thing, because that, be, that would be a good ending, wouldn't it? If I just lifted this up, and that would be a really good ending. Yeah. But yeah. I don't have a tattoo. I don't have a tattoo. I do have a lollipop. Hey. Because I gave blood last month. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what I found out? They don't actually give you a lollipop anymore. So I had to go and buy my own. <laughs> my name is Pat Higgins and my conscience is clear. Thank you very much.